Just as in the story from John's Gospel of Jesus calling Philip and Nathaniel to follow him, and Philip's evangelical invitation of come and see, in the appointed reading from Mark's Gospel, we hear another story of Jesus calling disciples, this time the fishermen siblings of Simon and Andrew, and James and John, which also concludes with an invitation to evangelism. Jesus tells the brothers, that if they will follow him, he will make them fishers of men. When it comes to the call to follow, none of these readings are particularly unique. Every New Testament lesson will always have something to do with discipleship, with following Jesus, and with evangelism, with proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. We might also say that every Sunday our lessons will somehow reflect the hope and expectation of engaging a life of faith, whether it be the hope and expectation of an exiled people reaching the promised land, or the hope and expectation of first-century believers believing they had found the promised Messiah in Jesus of Nazareth, or the hope and expectation of Paul and the first followers of Christ in Corinth who were awaiting his promised return. While our present world may be separated by time and culture and look drastically different than the biblical world, none of this should seem at all foreign or distant to us here and now, and our hope and expectation as a band of 21st century believers who gather faithfully as we await and participate in the coming of that kingdom. God's word resonates now as much as it did then. It encompasses all of time as we know it and beyond. Indeed, God's word transcends time. Time, in fact, plays a significant role in the Gospel of Mark, in which this scene unfolds. As we've noted before, Mark doesn't begin his gospel with Christ's nativity, as the other gospelers do in some way or another, but with Jesus' baptism, and then he's off and running. Mark's gospel is full of action and fast-paced. If you blink, you might be apt to miss some seemingly small detail, like the repetition of the word immediately. One thing we can say about Mark is he is never verbose. He is succinct, he gets right to the point, and he doesn't mince words. So it's interesting to see and hear him use the word immediately more than once in just seven short verses. Immediately, Simon and Andrew left their nets and followed him. Immediately, Jesus called James and John. And while the word itself is not used, there is an unequivocal immediacy in their response. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Immediately seems to be an important word for Mark. By the time we get to this scene set along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he has already used it in one of the very first lines of his gospel in telling of Jesus' baptism after which the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Before his gospel is over, and it's over before you know it, Mark will repeat the word another 24 times. In fact, the word immediately appears in Mark's gospel more frequently than in all of the other gospels combined. What are we to make of Mark's obsession with this notion of immediacy? of something happening straight away, of the complete absence of time between one thing and another, between being called and following. The words Jesus speaks in Mark's gospel give us a clue. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Words that speak not so much about the absence of time, but of time overflowing and transcending itself, the fullness of time, the perfection of time, the kind of time in which salvation operates and mercy unfolds, where grace happens and promises are fulfilled and disciples are formed. When Mark's gospel was first recorded, it was done so in Greek, in which there are at least two words for time, 
chronos, the ordinary kind of chronological time that we measure on clocks and calendars, and kairos, the significant kind of time in which the meaningful and extraordinary take place. When in our gospel this morning, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled, the Greek word for time Mark uses in that passage is not chronos, but kairos. In other words, Ordinary time had not simply come and passed by, but a sacred and opportune moment in eternity in which the illusion of time and space separating heaven and earth had been pulled away and the kingdom of God was within sight. Today, with all our digital doodahs and devices, we are always trying to keep up with time. Yet none of these have anything to do with God's time or the natural rhythms of the universe, and therefore, real life. If anything, these days, it seems maybe everything is a little bit too much immediately. In this lead, follow, or get out of the way world, there is no room for lingering in the moment. We ask each other, motivationally, where we see ourselves in five years from now. We draft specific and strategic ten-year plans And the future arrives alarmingly fast. Five years, ten, fly by before we even have time to file those plans in our to-do file. Time, or its passing, has a funny way of creeping up on us. Exactly five years ago on this very day, I stood astride the prime meridian in Greenwich, England, one foot firmly planted in the eastern hemisphere, the other solidly in the west. The prime meridian is the line of zero degrees longitude, the starting point for measuring distance both east and west around the earth, and therefore is of great importance to both navigation and timekeeping, as it provides a standard reference point for each. Whatever the local time zone, all our clocks are set in reference to what is known as coordinated universal time, which unfolds from the longitudinal line that runs through Greenwich, dividing the east from the west. That line at the Royal Observatory was established by Sir George Airy in 1851, but from its very beginnings it was established simply as an imaginary line from the North Pole to the South Pole, marking the astronomical longitude of zero degrees, zero minutes, and zero seconds. And it was not always in the place where I stood a foot in each hemisphere. It wasn't until U.S. President Chester Arthur called for an international conference in 1884, at which 41 delegates from 25 countries met and selected the line passing through Greenwich, as the world standard prime meridian. France, of course, abstained and long insisted that the prime meridian ran through Paris. You see where I'm going. The separating lines we humans draw, whether between east and west or one moment and the next, are always arbitrary. No matter how many borders or walls or lines in the sand our political leaders try to imagine. As Christians, The life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ is our prime meridian, the latitude and longitude from which we navigate our pilgrim journey. East is east, and west is west, and never the twain shall meet, Rudyard Kipling declared in his 1889 ballad. But east and west meet every day and everywhere on this beautiful blue ball we call home as it spins through the universe tilted on its axis just so. At Greenwich and at every single longitude. Almost a decade after and inspired by Kipling's hemispheric poem, William Arthur Dunkerley composed the still popular hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West. And later still, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would say in a speech in East Berlin that on either side of the wall are God's children, and no man-made barrier can obliterate that fact. Whether it be east or west, 
Men and women search for meaning, hope for fulfillment, yearn for faith in something beyond themselves, and cry desperately for love and community to support them in this pilgrim journey. The only place, the only place and time we really can be and are called to be faithful disciples of Christ is immediately, right here in the present moment, which is a time we ultimately can never divide up into minutes and seconds and measure out, but simply pours into us, fills us to overflowing, and flows back out into the world. Time and eternity constantly join together along the pilgrim journey that is the present moment. This isn't to say that we ought to completely turn our backs on time's passing or abandon clock-watching and calendar planning. It's just that in our 24-7 world, we seem to have forgotten that in addition to knowing what time it is, we need to know what kind of time it is. And right now is an extraordinary moment in time. Still, it takes vigilant attention to remain in the immediacy and abundance of the present moment for even a moment, even if it is extraordinary. But if we circle back now to the scene from the gospel, we find exemplars to follow. Jesus encounters first Simon and Andrew, and then James and John, all of them hard at work, mending and casting nets, with all the worries about having enough and the obligations of providing for the future that go along with that work. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus declares that what is most important isn't what might happen someday or did happen long ago, but what is happening right now. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. By staying present in every present moment, we learn a different sense of time, one that embraces the immediacy and the capacity of right now, where every breath can be an opportunity to repent. For when we turn away from all that has been or not been in the past and all that will or will not be in the future, we make more room in the present to just be, to be with God. And isn't that what we do when we are intentional about our prayer life as faithful disciples? Because discipleship requires prayer in order to be sustained. And prayer doesn't happen in the future or in the past. Prayer always happens right now in the everlasting present moment when we are present to God. So let us pray. Give us grace, O loving and ever-present God, to turn around and answer immediately the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we in the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works. Help us to remain present to you, who are always present to us, and grant us the ability to recognize the extraordinary gift of each and every moment, that we might see and cherish in every moment a reflection of the same, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.